In this report, the Beer Garden Physics deep dive into the humble weight distribution hitch. Some say it is the universal panacea when the problem is real man's 4x4 dragging its ass all the way to Dingo Piss Creek with a dirty big van in tow, whereas some others might suggest worst idea ever, dude. And I guess the truth is somewhere in the middle and it kind of depends on you. So let's do that, hopefully without bleeding too prolifically from the ears. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. For buyers here in Australia. Website for that. <laughs> yes, Lee. Or you can just, you know, click it good, dude. Olight is sponsoring this video. This is the Javelot Pro 2. It's a really high quality torch, more of a searchlight than most of the other torches I talk about. And I thought I'd mention it in this video because if you are that dingo piss creaky and 4x4 adventurer this thing has a shit ton of photons trapped inside and they're just gagging to be thrown in a tight concentrated searchlight like beam hell of a long way down the track so great for boating great for nighttime spotlighting whatever there's a diffuse cone of light as well around the tight spot so you can use it around the campfire it's pretty versatile there's a tactical switch on the back so you get two speeds there you get you know bright and jesus <laughs> that's bright and you know switch on the side as well so you know various intensities possible with that it's just a really well thought out product like most eye lights. It's waterproof and drop tested and all of that stuff. It uses a magnetic USB connector to recharge on the back. So you can recharge on the fly as you drive. If you want something a bit more pocket sized, I talked about this the other day. This is the Warrior Mini 2 and I carry one of these in black in my pocket all the time. It's on special as well. And if you want something that's a bit more bag friendly, this is the Warrior 3S. It's just got a bit more grunt than the Warrior Mini and fits in the hand just fine, but maybe just a bit big for the pocket. So anyway, all of those torches on sale at the moment, 40% off. There's a link and code in the description. And with that, let's talk about these weight distribution hitches, okay? Because this is a point of real confusion out there in the market. And I wanna start by thinking about this like an engineer. And you get to be an engineer too. It's not like you have to have a degree. Anyone can be an engineer. So my objective is to make you pretty much your own engineer on project weight distribution, yes or no. All right? So when you think about what a 4x4 is towing a caravan, you can just simplify and simplify and simplify and basically just chop away everything that doesn't matter, that doesn't pertain to this analysis. So let's just think about, here's your four by four, right? Sitting on a couple of springs, it's got a tow ball on the back and here's your van. And your van's basically just a big seesaw that carries 90% of the weight. The mass center of the van is slightly forward of the axles so that you get about 10% ideally worth of the mass of the van pressing down on the tow ball. That's what the tow ball download is, okay? And depending on how big the van is and how badly your combination is set up and how soft the springs are on the back of your 4x4, you might end up in a situation where it's all hooked up and it's looking like this, which is hardly ideal, is it? The arse of the van is like virtually a plough, almost sitting on the bump stops. The headlights are pointing at the moon and that reduces steering effectiveness and overall stability and it's just not fun. So wouldn't it be nice if there was a piece of physics magic that we could impose on this problem, you know, that was reasonably simple mechanically and just sorted it all out and got us to sit like this. I think that'd be lovely if there weren't any consequences. One of the cool things about being your own engineer is that when you're doing the analysis of forces and things like that, you can chop bits of the system away and just replace them with forces that 
uh, equivalent to what they're doing to the thing you give a toss about. And what we give a toss about, right, is our 4 by 4 sitting there with its ass in the dirt and its headlights in the sky. Okay, so we'll chop the van away and we'll replace that with a set of loads pressing down at the back here. And, you know, the loads up the front really don't change all that much because that's where the engine is and the gearbox and all that stuff. And you and your lovely wife. And that hasn't really changed. Right. So what we've just done is we've added a shitload of stuff at the back here and it's pressing the back down. It's acting a little bit like a seesaw and the lights are going up in the sky and we don't want that. So wouldn't it be lovely if we could just get our MIG welder out and put a dirty big hex nut on the side of our 4x4 and then get a spanner and get the Incredible Hulk to come and just sit on the end of it like that. Or just get, you know, a spanner and crank it this way. Put a bit of torque in the whole system, right? Now this is probably a way that you might not be used to thinking about torque, but you can apply a torque to any body in three-dimensional space. So we'll just put a spanner on our nut, hypothetically, and we'll crank it like that. And I hope you can see in your mind's eye that if we did that here, right, it levels things up. So if I had to design a mechanism that was going to level up an imbalanced 4x4 as a result of the loads imposed on it by a heavy caravan, I just need something that's going to be equivalent, at least in terms of the performance, of a dirty big spanner hanging on a dirty big nut with a dirty big load hanging off the spanner to give us the torque we need to level things up. So let's think about how to do that. So without letting the cat out of the bag here, what you want to do when you think about this stuff is you want to say, okay... Here's our tow ball, right? If that's our tow ball, and this is maybe where the standard tow ball is, maybe we can just raise the tow ball up a little bit to give us a bit of arm on our spanner. Let's say, you know, we had a spanner that was this long. Now we can have a spanner that's longer and it'll give us more torque. So the tow ball is rigidly attached to the vehicle. If we just increase its elevation a little bit, that's going to give us a bit more arm on our spanner if this is the spanner, okay? Here we've only got this much arm. If we raise it up, it's still rigidly connected to the vehicle, so it's not going to have any impact on the torque, if you like, that we impose. What it's going to do is just going to give us a longer arm, and as you know, a longer spanner equals more torque. And then we've got to figure out a way to put some force on it to give us the torque. And the other cool thing about torques and rigid bodies is you can impose the torque here around the center of the tow ball if you want, right? But on a rigid thing, you can move the torque anywhere and it will have exactly the same effect. This is like a fundamental of, you know, the, the, the way forces and torques interact with rigid bodies in space, okay? You can move torques anywhere. It doesn't make any difference. So it's really easy now to think about how to generate this torque because we've organized ourselves a bit of an increased spanner here on the tow ball. This is a bit longer now. And all we need to do is have something that generates a bit of tension back to the van, okay? And that's gonna give us our torque. And obviously, when we get force times distance, we're gonna get the torque we need to level things up, which would be fantastic, okay, if all we did ever was drive along a billiard table. And it's really easy to generate force. Like you can do it with torsion bar kinds of springs, a couple of bits of chains, some threaded fasteners. It's really not that hard. And just to put that in perspective, right? Let's say we're using M16 by 2.0 threads. That'd be a standard metric 16 millimeter thread. If we did that twice, so we had two threaded fasteners there. Think about a 400 millimeter breaker bar with an M16 nut on one end of it. You crank down like this with 40 kilos of force, okay? Every time you go around once and the diameter of your circle is 800 millimeters because the breaker bar is 400 millimeters long, that means the circumference is about two and a half meters, yeah? 
And that means every time you move two and a half metres with your 40 k's of load on the breaker bar, the nut advances two millimetres. And that's a mechanical advantage of 1,250 to one, which is just bleed from the ears, right? Even if you lose the vast majority of that advantage to friction between the threads, you know, when you're dragging the male thread over the female thread, then let's say you've only got 100 times mechanical advantage left, okay? That's four tonnes in each one of those threads. So the load here could easily, like dead easily, be eight tons, which is heaps in the context of the mass of the van and the static load that it imposes on the tow ball. It's just heaps, okay? So it's really easy to generate the kinds of loads you need to level things up. And again, the point needs to be made that it's not just static loads that you deal with. Obviously, there's dynamic loads. So, for example, kangaroo hops out, you hit the brakes. It's going to cause the van to want to rotate like this, and that's going to increase the download on your tow ball owing to the nature of dynamic forces, right? But what's going to happen there if there's a spring-type system in play is that that's just going to increase the tension in the spring, which is going to increase the size of the torque. And to some extent, at least, these load dynamic, these load leveling dynamic hitches are self-compensating for dynamic forces. And that's why there's no squatting under brakes and things like that, okay? So it's not a fixed amount of torque. The torque varies in relation to the dynamic loads that are imposed. And that's a good news, bad news story. And here's where this kind of thing comes unglued a little bit, okay? If you're driving down the road and you fall into a washaway, the front wheels come out of the washaway, they're back up on the road, and then the ass of your vehicle slams down into the washaway, it can quite easily cause these forces in play here by virtue of the extension of the spring and the geometry of the motion in between your vehicle and the van, right? It can cause these forces here to get out of control and for the torque to just be huge, all right? And you've got to remember that when you're talking about a tow ball, all right, the purpose of a tow ball or one of its key operational characteristics is to eliminate imposed torques in every plane. It can move with all kinds of rotational degrees of freedom, yeah? So all of a sudden, you're imposing a torque, and the imposition of this torque is essentially everywhere in the structure, including inside the tow bar, all right? So when you're in this situation, the torque on the tow bar and the loads on the tow bar can be just out of control. And the same can be said for this overhanging, cantilevered part of the chassis. It's not supposed to be talked like that. It's not designed to be talked like that. And that's why many manufacturers will say in the fine print about towing with vehicle X or vehicle Y, whatever, they will say load distribution, weight distribution, load leveling hitches, whatever. They will say not recommended or do not use them or something of that nature. And this is why if you do use one, you are rolling the dice with the mechanical integrity of your system because the tow bar was guaranteed not designed and certainly not validated to deal with load distribution kind of imposed loads. It just wasn't designed for that, okay? And surface of a billiard table, doesn't matter. Real outback problem could be a real issue. And that's why you should really carefully weigh up how you're going to drive, like if you are that type A driver on rabies who must hit it at 100 k's an hour, got to be doing 100, 110 the whole time, no matter how shit the road becomes, no matter how great the risk of falling into something like this, then that's a real problem. Spoon drains are a real problem too, you know, in boat launching areas and things of this nature. If you've got a real heavy boat and you go through a spoon drain, the torque imposed during that spoon drain negotiation manoeuvre can be out of frigging control. And that's why 
you need to just ask yourself a basic question, right? If a bunch of propeller heads at the manufacturer said, don't do that, and you decide, I might do that, you've got to ask yourself, what is it about you that makes you smarter than them? Okay, that's question number one. And even if there's no prohibition in the manual, you've got to ask yourself, what are the conditions you're going to operate the vehicle in and how might that manifest itself? Worst case scenario, because, hey, dude, I agree. Driving like this, dead level on a billiard table or any number of endless kilometres that approximate a billiard table, and there are plenty of good condition roads out there, but there's plenty of shit like this too. And if you're going to hit something like that with a load leveling hitch, this can lead to a really bad outcome. And I can't decide for you whether or not this is a good idea, but hopefully at least now you understand the advantage and the potential negative feedback that could really bring things unglued. So with that, over to you, dude.